Welcome to another episode of Exploring the Vintage NFT Space podcast with Zero G. Today, I'm uh, I'm excited to have uh, Seba on the uh, on the podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, Zero G. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited for this one. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to chatting with you today. It's uh, um, you know, it's I know it's been a, a whirlwind few months for you with the um. The greater NFT community uh, uh, hearing about your token and and kind of the sales and just all the stuff going on there. Um, but before we talk about your um, your token, why don't we like talk about your history in, in crypto? When did you first like hear about like crypto or Bitcoin, and what was what was the motivation? What finally got you to like jump in, either buy your first coin or or like start mining? So um, the history of me getting into crypto was uh, basically when I was younger, I got uh, I went to vocational computer uh, skills training school and I got really into computers when I was like 13 years old. I was already uh, certified for computer hardware repair and by 16, I was Microsoft certified and Cisco certified and then I started, I was collecting stamps when I was like in third grade and then when I got a little older and the in the 2008 collapse was coming, I started collecting silver coins. Oh, so yeah. I, was, I was doing something called coin roll hunting, which was basically I would go to the bank and buy $1,000 worth of half dollars. And then I'd rip open all the rolls of half dollars and I'd take the silver pieces out and go to another bank and dump the quarters back into the banking system. So I was kind of like mining silver coins, you know? <laughs> and I was I was researching the price of the coins on this website called coinflation.com, which I, I linked to you. And that website had a post about Bitcoin and how it was going to be like a digital gold. And I went for it and I did some research on it. And I was like, wow, this has everything I wanted because I was already looking into e-bullion before, but that got like shut down. Yeah. And there was other like e-gold and stuff like that that were out there, but they all got shut down. But Bitcoin wasn't able to get shut down, so it kept going. And I was like, hey, I got to get in on this. And the first thing I did was I started mining Bitcoin right away. And when I started mining, it was like in 2011. And I think the price was like $1 or less than a dollar when I started mining. And that's how it started. It was just like a history of collecting things of, with intrinsic value, you know? Like from stamps to coins and then to Bitcoin. And uh, it was like a combination. I saw it as like everything that I liked wrapped in one. It had coins, it had computers, it had money, and it was all there in one nice little package. And I was like, I got to go for this. And I went for it. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, it um, um, it's cool you're able to kind of recognize that so early too. Um, yeah, I mean, the, it... Uh, it, it's really amazing too. The the other thing that um, you know that that 2008 uh, crisis really opened you know a lot of people's eyes, myself included, to the the, the potential economic impact of Bitcoin too. So uh, you know, I that's something that's that we're still you know over ten years later, we're still seeing the you know the effects of Bitcoin as it's working its way through through the system. Yeah, the, um, it it was very 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 infantile when I first saw it, and it it drew me in because also it had the like a libertarian kind of mind state was required to understand it. Like yeah. you have to have the idea where about anarchy, and I think I had read some like anarchist manifesto before, and I had read this document called exit the matrix by ace evader that's after i watched the movie the matrix it really opened up my eyes about like how the government want to control stuff but this document by ace evader called network forensics evasion how to exit the matrix by ace evader it came out in 2006 and when i read that document in like 1999 2001 it made me 
start thinking about how to be anonymous online, which was what you needed to do to exit the matrix, like not get tracked. Why you're going to, why you want to subvert the trackers and things like that, like why privacy is important. So that document made me appreciate privacy. And when I saw Bitcoin, I was like, wow, this is making it very easy to achieve that privacy you need to exit the matrix. And I, and I thought like, well, privacy is going to be very important someday. So I better start getting myself into this because then I could, I could sell people privacy later as a, one of my IT services, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, like I'll get a call from like a, an upset lady and she'll be like, my ex-boyfriend is stalking me online or something. Can you help me get him to stop stalking me? And I'm like, okay, we can do that. We have to make you more private. So I've had a couple of customers like that, and it made me realize that privacy is going to be very valuable. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, you know, and that's one of the one of the I don't know if I'd call it a failure or an oversight, but I I think I know that was an intention to have Bitcoin be private, and um, you know, I I still hope that eventually there'll be something that makes it. Um, you know, a much more fungible, you know, without having to rely on, on mixers, you know? Yeah. The, the, it, sh it should, uh, what well, can you repeat that? I didn't quite catch that. I was that. just saying, you know, I, I, to me, it's a shame that Bitcoin in like, at least in this current state, isn't really private without the use of like coin join or mixers or something. So. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. You're totally right. Cause it's, it's, it's pseudo anonymity. It's yeah. not full anonymity. Um, but that's what the necessity to have a fully anonymous coin was what spurred people to go and create coins like Monero, Zcash, and Hush, and Mimble, Wimble's Grin, and there's a lot of them now. There's a lot of options for fully anon coins, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so so you got in, uh, got in really early, so you... Um... So when when did you first like make the jump from like GPU or CPU mining to ASIC mining? Oh yeah, so um, from 2011 till 2013, mm -hmm. I was mining primarily with GPUs, mm -hmm. and then in 2013 there was a there was a couple Bitcoin ASIC manufacturing companies that were around, and I had made pre-orders with a bunch of them, and I had ordered. USB miners and I was talking directly to the manufacturers because I have the ability, I have, I'm a certified technical trainer also. That's one of the certifications I got when I was in computer school. So very easily able to teach people how to mine. Mm -hmm. So being able to teach people how to mine, then I could sell them the unit and then teach them how to mine and then they're satisfied with their product and service. So when the ASIC miners started coming out onto the market, there was the Block Eruptor ASIC miner that I, I purchased those for like $20 a piece in the summer of 2013. Those were the first ASIC miners I bought. And um, I think they were at two Bitcoin each or something. And Bitcoin was at $10. That was the initial price when they first came out. And oh, then wow. I got, and then I got into um, uh, other miners, like there was Butterfly Labs, there was yeah. oh, there's hash fast which went bankrupt butterfly labs went bankrupt coin terra was there they went bankrupt there was a uh, av uh, uh, there's one fried cat that was the guy making the block eruptors hold on one second uh so block eruptor was the best best item that was around because he was shipping them super fast and i was working with this guy on the forum, his name was Canary in the Mine. And I would order Block Eruptor blades off him up until 2014, January. I was ordering Block Eruptor blades from him and reselling them on eBay and Amazon. So I would pay the I would pay the manufacturer or the the distributor of the ASICs in Bitcoin. And then I would go sell them for dollars elsewhere. And then I would take those dollars and buy Bitcoin again. And then I would go and buy more miners, and that was the cycle that kept repeating over and over again. Oh, cool. 
Yeah, that's that's quite the hustle too. Um, so there's a little bit of a premium on eBay for the gear at the time. Yeah, there, 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 I was able to have sometimes really huge margins and sometimes very, very small margins. For example, there was this miner that came out in 2013 by a company called Bitfury. And um, Bitfury was out of Georgia, but there was an American representative named, uh, I think his name is George Carlson, or no, Dave Carlson. And he was running big, uh, a mega big power in the United States and he was mining and he had, a, and he had the first 100 tera hash mine mining operation. And I purchased USB miners from him. They were called red fury. The red furies came defective from the factory. And what I did was I repaired the defects and I overvolted the hashing chip and changed some surface mount components of resistor and LED and, and those replacements uh, made it go faster by about 20 percent in giga hashes. So if it was at like two giga hashes, it was now doing two point four giga hashes. Mm -hmm. And those black fairies, I was selling them for five hundred dollars a piece in December twenty thirteen, when I had purchased them for twenty five dollars a piece in the summer of twenty thirteen. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, but people <laughs> were sending me their red fury so mm -hmm. that I could do the modification on it, and then I would ship it back to them. Is that crazy? Yeah, that is crazy. Wow. I was, like, crazy. I was, like, modifying and redesigning miners back in 2013. That, like, that, like, that joy of doing that, like, pushed me into doing it even more and trying to really secure deals with these manufacturers so I could be, like, a top reseller. That's awesome. Yeah, that's quite the hustle you had going on, man. Yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> I, you know, I remember waiting um, there. Uh, I, I didn't get into the Bitcoin mining, uh, but I was waiting on the like Butterfly Labs was was promising to release this more like super efficient miner. And I was waiting on that to be available. And then they went bankrupt. So I never got into yeah. Bitcoin mining at the time. I met Josh Zerlin, the CEO of Butterfly Labs, in December of 2013 at the first uh, Bitcoin conference called Inside Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. And they had like a new uh, mining card that they were showing off there. They had a booth. I mm -hmm. actually bought a miner from their booth at the event. Like no the way. only one they had available. Yeah. And then I also got Josh Zerlin, the CEO, to autograph a Bitcoin paper wallet for me. And oh, that's cool. they had this PCIe, like it looked like a video card, you know, but it would yeah. plug into the PCIe slot and it would have like their Butterfly Labs chips on it for hashing. I think that was the one you were waiting for, right? I probably, yeah. I remember that. Um, uh, I remember that whatever whatever ASIC I was waiting on, like they went bankrupt before they shipped. I think, and I think it's, yeah, it must have been that one. Yeah, it was pretty harsh. Like the way the they, you know, they couldn't compete with their Chinese, the American mining manufacturers and designers could not compete with the Chinese mining manufacturers because the Chinese were, were there present in like Guangzhou or Shenzhen mm -hmm. where they were getting all their chips and everything. They were there on the spot getting the chips. The American manufacturers had to like be so far from where the chips were actually being made and sold so it made their made them lag behind you know and have their costs higher that's why when bitmain first came on the scene and they were i met bitmain first at the texas bitcoin conference in 2014 mm -hmm. and they literally had a u-haul truck full of miners and they were just dumping them on the floor like selling them like crazy and i like literally filled my entire car with miners that time and i made a, <laughs> a contract with them to like be a reseller for them you know because mm -hmm. i had had it like these this coin terra hash fast butterfly labs those guys really dropped the ball on their customers they could have been like powerhouses today but they just couldn't compete with the chinese that's what happened man you know and because they were american companies they were able to get you know the, the legal stuff involved but the company like say for example black arrow limited did you hear about them no. Uh, Black Arrow Limited was a manufacturer in China also 
but it was like an international company and they screwed over all their customers worse than butterfly labs worse than cointera i had put in like a bunch of money down to purchase like a good amount of miners from them to resell and they arrived like two years late and they were useless by oh the time God. i got them. yeah that was that so is sad man I, but that's like what i was gambling on instead of gambling on like buying the coin and like trying to flip the coin instead i was gambling on pre-orders and orders of hardware you know yeah you know and but i totally i totally get what you're trying to do because i remember um you know every time there would be a new like when i was still following mining um you know every time you'd get a new uh, more efficient miner out there you know the people that had pre-orders they had guaranteed profit while um until the the difficulty adjusted and then there would be scalpers on ebay where you know, like you said there's there'd be a significant premium at least for a while for those more efficient miners so yeah i mean the for one of for one example about that that was the most uh, severe example about the efficiency of miners was bitmain made a sia coin miner called the a3 yeah i remember that i, I actually had a couple day- of obelisks oh yeah the obelisk so the uh, the obelisk was competing with the a3 and the a3 yeah. got to market before the obelisk did and if you had an a3 the first day of mining it you probably made like a thousand dollars worth of sea coin you know like those guys those a3s were blasting sea coin like crazy the first couple of days you know and then obelisk and sea uh, coin labs they like they like made all the a3s turn into bricks by changing yeah. their code the yeah, hashing algorithm you know what they did was was really um interesting know, i mean i think that ultimately that's one reason why uh why one of the reasons why their technology didn't get more adoption is i mean they basically played dirty pool with the um in order to give their own miners an advantage you know yeah they they wanted to save their investors and the the people they kind of like centralized the hardware manufacturing while they were trying to be a decentralized company. And yeah. they showed everybody their true colors when they centralized the mining operation into it only is. their manufactured miners. So it's kind of like two-faced, you know? It they is. showed the public that they were two-faced and then they lost a lot of their reputation because of doing that. Yeah, I, I agree. I was I was really following them because I, I, I really thought they had, uh, you know... Most of the most of the infrastructure coins ended up being dumpster fires in terms of investments, but I I remember I was really excited about the potential of decentralized storage to be used for a variety of applications, and like you said, when when they did that, it it pulled the rug on any um, on any credibility that they had with me, you know. Um, and then after the fact, they tried to say, oh well, we won't do that again, and we're not actually going to make a miner or some some stuff like that but the damage was already done you know you can't yeah. unring that unring that bell you know and they you know to your point too all those the guys that had those a3s they brick they essentially brick those and for what reason just because they didn't make them yeah they they just got very desperate and made a very very bad decision and they made an enemy out of bitmain too when they did that because bitmain started getting lawsuits from people that bought a3s that couldn't use them to mine anymore mm-hmm. can you, you you know what i mean like i know yeah. personally one of the guys that made a lawsuit against bitmain and that that's kind of messed up that they they did that but the, yeah. I, I was very deep into sidecoin in the 2017 bull run Me too. so i yeah. saw everything like firsthand i saw everything that was going down you know what's funny is I don't know if you follow the news, but I think they just announced that the, um, isn't it like the the actual development arm like shut down up for C? Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think it was a Seal Labs or something. Yeah, they 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 basically had no more funding, and the funding like the from the VCs that they were getting to keep going like dried up, and they weren't getting any more new rounds. So I think what happened is they lost to the competition, which was Filecoin. You know. Yeah, I mean, so they lost to Filecoin, but the other one that I wasn't really aware of until recently that is actually getting use in the NFT scene is um, Arweave, you know? Um, Arweave? Yeah. 
Uh, I haven't really looked into that one. I'll check it out, though. Yeah, so, I mean, people are using it for decentralized storage <laughs> of, like, for, like, the image to create an immutable link for their, um, for the image for the, for their NFT. Instead of hosting it on IPFS, you can use Arweave instead. Sweet. I'm going to definitely check this one out. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good times. I mean, um. You know, I didn't even keep those, uh, my obelisks. I just let the, you know, after they became inefficient, I just trashed those. But, you know. <laughs> oh, <times>. man. <laughs> I, I, I've, I wish you had sent them to me and I could turn them into an art piece for you. I know, right? Because <laughs> uh, now, now I kind of regret doing that. But they were, um, you know, those were also really terribly designed, too. Like, um, like those little, like, heat sinks would fall off. The, the way they did it was just... Oh you know, man, rookie, rookie! Wow, man. that's a, that's hilarious. So uh, there was another tidbit about me and Seacoin was I developed or I'd helped develop uh, and brought to market the first Seacoin miner, which was called Seaberry, and it was a uh, basically a Raspberry Pi connected to an eight terabyte hard drive and a flash drive, and it would do the storage. Mm -hmm. It would work on the storage of the Seacoin files. <clears throat> But um, we didn't do that well because there was a lot of um, negative negativity towards us and my group of developers at the time because they like they kept poking around and like saying it wasn't secure. Like we didn't give them the open source code, and you know they didn't they didn't appreciate our work and we we were selling them very cheap and just telling people how to run it. We maybe had like five people buy it. Mm -hmm. But then what I ended up doing was running, I ended up having like 25 units I was supposed to resell, but I did couldn't sell them. So I decided to just run them all and I ran them all. And then I, I performed a Sybil attack on the Seacorn network by gaming the reputation system of the servers. The Seaberries ended up being the like top 25 servers in the Seacorn network were the Seaberries that I had. And it was like a data farm where I had about 200 80 terabytes of data capacity and what happened was i ended up taking over like 30 percent of the data that was on the network that's and, incredible yeah and then i and then i and then i ended up burning it all <laughs> destroying all the data <laughs> <laughs> i was that pissed off at them for like not being so supportive of my project where i just turned my project into like a reflection like you guys are hating on me. Okay, well, I'm gonna send it right back at you, 10x. You know, and well, I exposed the big weakness in Seacoin, and they created a I created a patch and tools to like decentralize yourself because I was like the centralizer. You know, I started centralizing yeah. Seacoin. Mm -hmm. So they made an app called the Decentralizer, and they everybody had to go and like redo their contracts because they had a 3x redundancy on your data, right? Yeah, yeah. But if, if you got 50 servers available for your data storage and it's all sharded out to all of them and you got 3x redundancy based on those 50 servers. But if 30 of those servers are Sabu's Seaberries and they go offline, you're going to have 0.9 or 0.8 redundancy and your files are getting deleted off the network. So I proved to them that the data is not safe. You know, they kept saying your yeah. data is safe. It's never going to get deleted. But I proved to them that it was possible to delete it. Yeah. And I mean, because I was exposing those weaknesses to them, that's why they got even more upset with me. I mean, that's a great point because I, that, like, to your point, that's one thing that I thought was cool is that they had, they had, you know, a method of, of quote unquote protecting the data. But like you said, you know, the three X three X copies doesn't work whenever the network itself is um is civil attacked. And you know, like the top like you're saying, like the top twenty five or fifty hosts are all actually in reality controlled by the same person. Yep. That was a really fun time to be to be myself, you know, because I like to do stunts on the blockchain to get attention. Mm -hmm. That's like what keeps me going, like and drives me to keep uh, trying to perform, you know. And I always want to make it big somehow and like try and be known as a person that like really heavily tests and stress tests the system and tries to break things and improve them. Some people appreciate my work very much. That's like and the some OG, people don't. 
the the OG definition of a hacker, you know? Yeah, pretty much. Well, cool. I mean, that's uh, you know, it's funny we both have the the you know the commonality with the, the Cia coin, um, you know, which I think that's pretty much gone gone to zero or or pretty close to it. Um, I mean, it's r- irrelevant now in terms of usage. Last time I looked, um, but um, yeah, they're probably going to stop trading against Bitcoin and start trading against Dogecoin a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's sad. I uh, again, they had like tremendous potential, but you know, it is what it is. Well, I mean, hey, that's a story for most of the alts back then too, right? You know, at least some of them had potential. But uh, you know, I know you're getting involved in some um, into some art and some creative work. So why don't you tell me about your your background in in art and kind of like what you've been doing there? Oh sure, sure yes. Yeah. So um. When I was in college, I took a photography class because I really um, wanted to get away from the computers a little bit for some time, but still have like electronics around me, but away from the computer. So I thought the camera would be a great way to get away from the computer and go outdoors and go meet people and interact with people, and socialize with the camera in hand. And I failed the photography class, but because <laughs> I just couldn't understand the, the assignments were very difficult. The the professor was very very strict, but I did understand that I did learn all the concepts that I could. And then later, later on, um, in 2016, I was 100% out of crypto, and I I started getting tired of working on computers and doing it work so i went and got a job at a hollywood lighting company Mm -hmm. and this lighting company i was like a i was like a stagehand you know and i got into the stagehand work because i wanted to learn how to do lighting better so i could improve my photography because it's all about the, the the study of capturing the light you know and that art form i wanted to develop my skill in it more so and i wanted to do like some grunt work and not be sitting on a computer all the time so i got into a lighting company and did a bunch of red carpet events and some music events some concerts and then i was like okay i did a concert now i want to go do a music festival so i went to a music festival called lightning in a bottle as a lighting volunteer so i volunteered to be on the lighting team and then after my volunteer days were done. I was like, Hey, you guys want to like pay me, start paying me and I'll keep working. And they hired me right there on the spot. And I became part of the team, like paid also. And then I, I set up all the lights and that I could, and I did a bunch of work. And then during the event, I just roamed around with my camera everywhere and just tried to capture beautiful moments, you know, of people like having fun. And I, I really enjoyed being an event photographer. And then I went and did a couple more like, Maybe like over the course of from 2016 to 2018, I probably worked like 20 festivals and I always would be on the lighting team. And then during the event, I would go around as a photographer because I had staff credentials, which was like the highest level of credentials you could have at the event. You could basically go anywhere and I would capture all these photos and it had a really good time and met like a lot of cool people and made a lot of friends and I really enjoyed doing the photography, but it was very boring way of sharing my photography work. Cause all I would do is post it on Facebook in an album and then people would go like comment, share, whatever. And then in this bull run back in like when COVID started, I guess I got into making NFTs. My first NFT in this bull run was on Rarible and it was just like a meme collage that I had made um, in a in 2014, I believe, a picture of me. And and then I got into Tezos and and I really enjoyed Tezos. And then the Tezos NFT market popped up called Hicket Nunk, which is I believe Latin for here and now. And I started making photograph my photography NFTs. I started loading on to Hicket Nunk on the Tezos blockchain. And it was very early 
early in uh, hey, get, uh, uh, NFT space and Tezos was very early. I was very early into it. So I had some decent sales and I was like, wow, my photography is being purchased now. So I finally, after like, I don't know, like four or five years of never selling one of my photos, my photos finally started selling because of the NFT market and because of NFT collectors appreciating my photographs. <clears throat> so that's where my artistic skill of being a photographer started getting appreciated. So I got even deeper into making NFTs and looking at the code of how NFTs are made and understanding how to build my own NFT platform, which I've set up. And that's basically like what led me to where I, where I became uh, a photograph, photographer, NFT artist, I guess. But so I started getting some sales and the sales were going good. Um, I think the most I've sold one of my photo NFTs for is like $80 for one. But then I was collecting other people's NFTs and reselling them for ridiculous markups and they were selling. And then I was like, okay, I should get a new camera. So I went went out and bought a new brand new brand spanking new Sony a7 IV and I built a new computer for myself so I could edit the photos fast. And then I started trying to go to events again after COVID like wore off kind of, you know, like the lockdowns wore off yeah. and I started going to events again and started getting booked for events and getting paid to go to the event to shoot as a photographer. And then at the same time, taking those photos that I shot at the event and minting them as NFTs and selling them again. So I was getting multiple, uh, multiple forms of income off of doing the same off of doing one thing, you know? And I thought that was really amazing. And it really inspired me to keep pushing my artistic skill. And because finally, like, I found a way for people to appreciate my photography and support me. And then the thing that I created um, that was like the highlight of uh, this last two years uh, NFTs on Tizos was I made a collection of a event. So the pictures of this event called Libera. So it's like a collection of 53 photos. And what I did was I told people that if you buy 10 of these NFTs from the Libera collection, you're going to get a VIP ticket to the next Libera event. So I, I made a, a physical experience born out of collecting digitals photos. So it was kind of like, tick, uh, I was trying to make the most easiest, most basic way to understand NFT ticketing for people. And That's that really works. Cool. It, it worked. Like the, the producer of the event was super excited about it. The people that attend the event that didn't know anything about crypto were excited to learn about crypto. And they're like, wow, I'm an NFT. Cool. Thank you, Cebu. They're, they're excited to be an NFT. You know, like all my friends in the dance music scene, we're very excited about it. here. I'll link you the um, that collection here. I'll put it in the chat. So that um, that collection uh, was des designed to make tickets from sales. So I had two people collect on that VIP ticket, and the VIP ticket, what it detailed was: you get the you get entry to the event, you get two drinks, you get backstage VIP access to all the behind the DJ and all that and like the VIP room. And then you would also get a directed photo shoot session with Cebu at the event. So like oh, I would cool. I would make them like the badass profile picture or something, you know? Like I would make a very beautiful photo of them at the VIP at the event would get like a, a very nice photo from me. So they were very happy to get their photo. Uh, while they're at the event like they were all dressed up cute and everything you know and they're having a lovely time and they're like and I was taking pictures of them and they appreciated all that attention I gave them so I made them feel like a VIP you know even though like the producer of the event wasn't selling VIP tickets I just like kind of made it up you know mm -hmm. and just rolled with it so I'm thinking the that kind of concept uh, of approaching of, of uh, an NFT 
ticket sales can be a very big way to get people to adopt purchasing NFTs. Because what if, say, for example, like a really high-end event, like uh, say, for example, Electric Daisy Carnival, EDC. Mm -hmm. What if I buy EDC VIP passes, which are like really hard to get, for example, then the demand for the photographs that are crypto art NFTs will have a much higher demand because I'll be the only source to get a VIP ticket to EDC would be for buying it from Cebu. Yeah. Like I have to go for like bigger events. Now this event was like a small hole in the wall warehouse rave, you know, like underground stuff. But if I go to like a big leagues event, it could be a whole different ball game, you know? Yeah. I mean, there were the, that whole ticketing industry is definitely ripe for disrupt for, uh, for disruption. I mean, we've seen, in the U.S., there was like a, a little mini outroar for um, recently with a Taylor Swift concert where yeah, I think the majority of the tickets were listed at like twenty thousand dollars or something. So, <laughs> so fans were uh, were super pissed. We've got a monopoly in the U.S. right now between Ticketmaster and and maybe one other venue where they've just got a lot. Stop Hub, yeah, yeah, Stop Hub, yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, this is this would definitely be a way where. Um, you know, there's there's a couple different ways you could approach it, but you know, like using using NFTs and using crypto would, would effectively allow us to cut them out of the out of their role as the middlemen. You know, basically just destroying the entire um, the entire market. You know, yeah the 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 tickets being sold. Um... Re, being resold on StubHub, I, I've, I've even done it myself. I've even done it myself. Like for an event a couple of weeks ago, um, mm -hmm. I was going to a Purple Disco Machine event in downtown LA, and I bought a VIP ticket for like two hundred fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. I was like, man, I spent too much. I should just resell this ticket and get a general admission. So I resold the ticket. I made a profit of like forty dollars, and then I just went and bought a general admission ticket. It was super easy. PayPal money just went right in my account. There was no like fuss, you know, it was super easy to do. So StubHub is doing it right, man. You could just, you could easily buy that $20,000 ticket and sell it for 25,000, but your profit is only going to be like a thousand because StubHub is going to take a huge cut out of your resale. They take, they took a huge cut for their service fee. It's like ridiculous. If another StubHub comes out, as a new name, new brand, it has a less fee. They're going to take out StubHub. You know, they're, they, they're ripe for competing with. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and the same thing on the, on even on the, the issuance side with Ticketmaster, you know, I've been to events where you can, um, you know, if it's not a super expensive event, you'll pay like 20% of the, of the actual or more. Uh, there are some of the smaller ones is like a third of the cost is actually service fees or half the half is service fees for you know, like a small electronic event or something. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, I mean, we all, and like, of course, you know, like the, the cost to actually, you know, host a website and um, to, to service requests is nominal nowadays. So it's just pure, they're just pure scamming everyone. Yeah, pretty much. That's so that's one of what the that's noticing that was what prompted me kind of to go into attempting mm -hmm. like to experiment with NFT based ticket sales because yeah. I wanted to make it like um, the VIP mm -hmm. is gonna get paid to go to the event and have fun. That was my concept. Like, yeah, if if you could buy the photo NFT and then you get your VIP ticket, right, and mm -hmm. then after the event. You resell, you resell those ticket NFTs that you bought and you make back more money. Then yeah. essentially you got paid to go be an NFT uh, VIP guest at a party. So that would be groundbreaking concept, you know, where yeah. you're getting paid to party. Are you serious? Like this would be like an enjoyable life for anybody that's, you know, in the party scene a lot. And yeah. I thought that idea was really crazy, but it's possible. It's very possible. Yeah, you know, the other thing, too, that would be really interesting, Cebu, is that uh, if, you know, like, while well, while it's like still we're still in this weird messed up market, like see if there would be a um, a difference in value for even for the same event for 
basically a, an NFT token for the uh, for the event versus the traditional Ticketmaster slash whatever it is like uh, StubHub like way of selling. Like people may pay more for like uh, you know being able to access and trade it you know as a as a token instead of you know via their their traditional system. But yeah, I mean, I love your concept of being able to get get paid to to party. That's that's super wild. Yeah, and, and and you're right. Like what the if the NFT ticketing can be done in a way where there's less friction for the user and the seller, then the fee, the service fee, the platform takes will be a lot less. If we're just using a regular old NFT marketplace with like a two and a half percent service fee, compared to like StubHub's like thirty percent service fee. It's, you know it's, how it's a no I just realized how simple it could be, Sebu, is that um, you know, we could we could trade these like tokens for the tickets on our own. And then you could have like a little um a little like kiosk where you could uh redeem the token for um you know for those tickets that are being um custodied, you know, on the, the platform at the event, you know, at the door. Like, you know, so you could still have like quote unquote um, you know. Ticketmaster tickets that you know, like you could buy 500 of them, like tokenize them, allow them to trade, and then just have a little kiosk where people could, whoever the owner is, can redeem it for the for their bullshit ticket um, from Ticketmaster at the event. You know, yeah, that that would be like a box office thing. We would have to basically yeah. like bring the standard of technology at the box office of the mm -hmm. event to a level where they understand crypto. It's gonna take well, some time, but they're 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 starting to think about it and wanting to do it. Like the producers want to do it. They're receptive to it. But if you tried this five years ago, they'd be like, hell no, no way in hell I'm going to do NFT tickets. But, but now they're like, mm -hmm. Oh, this is a cool concept. It's hip. It's trendy. Everyone was, everyone is going to give it a shot. Let's do it. So because of that, like now is the time to really build that technology and that standard, yeah. you know? Yeah, for sure. That's a ton of opportunity out there. Um, well, uh, the uh, I guess kind of circling back. So, when did you first like learn about Counterparty and NFTs? Well, the Counterparty, I I was um pretty deeply into like researching all the altcoins and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like whenever a new altcoin would be announced, I would be I would try my best to be like the from being able to mine the current the the token the first day mining is available yeah. so that i could get a big share of the tokens and you know sell it for a large amount of profit once it pumps up so in that mentality i was like okay if anything new comes out in crypto i just got to dive in immediately and try to learn and use it immediately and figure out how to bring the utility of that thing into reality. So, well, counterparty, what happened was, um, you know, I was mining uh, Bitcoin and like Litecoin and Feathercoin and all these other like Prime Coin. Those were like early 2014. Mm -hmm. The first real altcoin I started mining, I believe, was called Battlecoin, which is a fork of Bitcoin. That died, obviously, but I never heard it, of that one. <laughs> yeah. <it> was, <laughs> yeah that was funny like it was like a it was like an omen you know like there's gonna be a war going on with all these alternate currencies you know they were ready to go to war because i, I look at it like a battleground and then so the counterparty was announced on bitcoin talk and that's probably where i learned about it initially and i went and looked into it and i basically thought of how wh how what need do i have that this token can can fulfill so my problem at the time was i didn't have enough floating capital so what would happen is i would say for example i had five thousand dollars and in that one week i get five thousand dollars worth of orders on the internet for miners now I, I get $5,000 from Amazon, for example, and then I'd go and buy Bitcoin with it. And then I pay for the miners to get drop shipped to the buyers. 
and and what would happen was I would run out of money all the time. Like I would just run out of money, run out of money, and then my volume would slow down. My volume's momentum of sales would slow down because I didn't have enough capital. So I said to myself, look, we could raise some floating capital by creating this token, charging $100 for the token. At the time, it was like 0.11 Bitcoin, I believe, was like $100. And what we'll do is we'll sell $100 miners in exchange for the token. So like the token was kind of like you're pre-ordering miners for me. That's kind of what the idea was. So the person would help me with having more floating capital because I had more Bitcoin now. I could go buy more miners because they bought this token off me and gave me more floating capital. And they're not claiming their miner right now. They're going to claim their miner later. So I get to work with the capital that they gave me until the time comes where they claim their their exchange for the miner with the Cebu token. So the Cebu token was designed f to have me get more floating working capital in my hands so I could purchase more to sell more. That was the reason I created it. And, and the other reason it was so I could get a pre-ordering kind of system like like the buy, the buyer didn't want to buy a miner right now, but they want to have like priority given to them. Like say, for example, a new miner is going to drop next month, but we're not opening sales for it. We're not going to do pre-orders for that miner. But if you buy a Cebu token, you will be put on the front of the list to exchange uh, a Cebu token for the miner that comes out next month, for example. So it was kind of a pre-ordering system also where the person had already given me their payment and we have avoided using the dollar. So I wanted to start avoiding using dollars in the trade business that I was doing. I wanted to use Bitcoin as much as I could. So selling the miner through a sub so they would sell the Cebu token to them for Bitcoin and I would get Bitcoin to be able to go buy their miner with Bitcoin and I would avoid the dollar completely. That was another reason too, because converting from Bitcoin to dollar and then going back and forth all the time, it was a mess. You know, like I would, I would drive down to Santa Monica to this uh, place, the offices of this company called Express Coin, which was created by Brock Pierce and I would basically be buying Bitcoins from Brock Pierce with cash in hand in person. And I would go down there like once a week to restock back up because I didn't want to wait on buying it off of Coinbase. No, I had no good. time. I had no time to wait a whole week to buy Bitcoins from Coinbase for the money to clear. So I would go buy them in person from Brock. So Brock remembers me. We had good, good relations. He also helped me get a Bitcoin payment processing on my website, Sabu.com at the time had uh, a plugin for WooCommerce that enabled uh, Bitcoin payments through Brock Pierce's and, and Steve Beauregard's company that was a uh, BitGo, I believe it was called, where I could make invoices and stuff generated on the website and that could get paid with Bitcoins. I, I had a good relations with them and they always were very good with me in business and I really appreciate them for helping me get my business going, you know? Yeah, that's really cool. Um, you know, it, uh, the, and it, it turns out, so, you know, recently it, it, as far as we're able to tell at, at this point that your, the Cebu token is the first token that was issued that was redeemable for a physical product, which is, uh, which is super cool. Yeah, that, that was the, that was the intention, yeah, and I, I don't know, I didn't realize it was the first at the time. I didn't realize it was the first until literally this year, and it was, um, I really felt good inside, you know, like feeling like that I'm finally being, my work is finally really, really appreciated. Like, people appreciate the work I've done, but this kind of like, 
it felt like someone gave me like a Grammy, you know, <laughs> or or like a Oscars kind of thing. Like I'm, I was like super surprised. It was like an award I won, or like I won a contest or something. Felt like that kind of feeling, you know. Well, why don't, why don't you explain, like, tell the story about how, um, you know, how you came to to understand and learn learn that it actually was the the first token and kind of your experience, like, you know, starting to distribute those and and kind of coming up with your plans. Oh sure, so um, I had the wallet uh was secure and like I would open it like every once in a while and check they're still there and everything, and I had uh, there's this NFT meetup called NF Tuesdays in Los Angeles and every Tuesday they have a meetup and they wanted to have me be a speaker at one of the dates so I became a speaker. And I talked about my NFT experience and my past and present NFT experience and kind of my future ideas that I was trying to do. And I spoke about how I had created my first NFT in 2014. And that kind of like sent a signal out into the universe, I felt like. And and what happened after like two weeks after speaking about it at an event, um, a user on tele on Twitter messaged me pax .og or no pax og .og or operator .eth messaged me and he's on, on Twitter and he says, "Hey, uh, are you the creator of Sabu Token on Counterparty?" And I'm like, "Yeah, that was me." And then he says, "Oh, do you still have access to those tokens?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I still have access to the tokens." And then he says. He sends me a link to my website on archive.org, and I had I had not seen my web I had never seen my website on archive.org, and he sends me this link to my website, sabu.com in 2014, like August, what it looked like, and on there he shared me the counter part counterparty or counterwallet.co sabu token offering. And he shared me that and he said, this blows my mind. And he was like, did you? And then he shares me another page by JP Jensen that says like the, the like milestones of counterparty history. And then I see Sabu is listed there on JP Jensen's uh, milestone, like, like historian style website. And it says Sabu token was the first digital no, the first uh, to broadcast on the counterparty network and talk about its own self on the counterparty network and a broadcast. And it was the first NFT to have a link to an image in its description. And then uh, operates.eth said, you know, you probably have the best claim to be able to say that you were the first digital, and he's encouraged me to to start selling the Sabu token again. So it was kind of his little nudge nudge from Operators.eth to get into trying to sell them. And I just hap and then I started. Get, I was like, okay, fine, I'll sell some. And then just like out of nowhere, like without announcing, without creating hype without like any marketing i just listed them for sale and i said hey they're for sale now and then they got scooped they, like the amount that i put up for sale was the first amount was 50 units at like a hundred dollars worth of bitcoin i think it was point zero zero five 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 or point zero yeah i think point zero zero five 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 was a hundred something like that and the 50 units sold out overnight and then the next day uh, Adam McBride, uh, um, Pax OG said, you should go on the NFT Now show with Adam McBride and talk about the Cebu token. So I went and did that and um, it generated a lot of hype. So I was, I never had never been hyped up that much myself ever, pretty much. And it was kind of feeling like, it was kind of feeling like, you know, on Black Friday, when people burst in the, through the doors and they go grab all the PlayStations and TVs? Yeah, yeah. 
it, it felt like I was the it felt like I was the Best Buy and people were rushing in to buy the Xboxes. <laughs> it felt <laughs> like that. <laughs> so I sold another batch of like a hundred during the Twitter space with Adam McBride. I dropped another batch of a hundred in a dispenser, and that sold out instantly. And basically, two Bitcoin blocks, twenty minutes, it was sold out. And the the haphazardness of my drop, my, I had to do a lot of refunds. So the way counterparties dispensers work, uh, a lot of people basically like overbought, and I had to refund all of them. And I did refund all of them. I actually even hired a certified blockchain accountant for a couple of days to help me sort through all the refunds and we got 100% of all the refunds done in like two weeks and then yeah the, and then I just sold a little bit more like to the European market because they weren't online during that time when I did the 100 drop and and then after that I figured out how to use emblem vaults and people were saying you should emblem vault some of them so I went and made some emblem vaults and that was really cool. I, re I was really amazed by the Emblem Vault technology. And I think it's really amazing. Um, so I made a couple listings of the token on OpenSea with Emblem Vault. And I think I sold like two or two or four of them like that so far. And it went pretty okay. And, and then I was like, you know what? Let's see. Someone was trying to buy out all the tokens. There was a guy, he was like, I will buy them all. You don't have to like bother with selling them and treating the market <laughs> and everything. And I could just buy them all and I'll resell them for you. So like he was trying to buy like, I don't know, like 750 or 780 token, all that was left. And he offered like, I think like 25 or 50 <laughs> grand, something like that. But I didn't accept the offer. But then I decided to put an emblem vault up on OpenSea with 750 Cebu tokens. And the emblem vault says also that the purchaser of that emblem vault will get the private key of the, that created the Cebu token. And I set the price at 999 Ethereum and it's just sitting there now. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's kind of a crazy number. And, um, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's just there. Like, I'm. I don't know if it's gonna sell. Maybe it'll sell. Maybe it won't sell. But it's just there. And I, I did that because I didn't want to feel like I was being rushed into selling it for too cheap. You know, I. I kind of yeah. feel like I rushed into selling them too cheap. Maybe, or I kind of feel bad because some buyers got upset with me because I started selling them cheaper than the mint price and they got upset. And then, you know, people just got all these objections to like how I was doing things and it was kind of stressful. So I kind of felt like to get rid of the stress about the selling the token and marketing it and, you know, serving the public and doing everything I'm supposed to do that they would desire that's positive about it. It was very stressful. So I just put them all up, all in one emblem vault. And I'm like, okay, I don't have to think about it for a little while, you know? I could just take it easy for a little bit. Yeah. That's kind of how that went. <laughs> yeah, you know, it. Uh, I, I was able to snag a couple of the... Um the tokens myself when you had the dispensers up and then um you know i'm really fortunate enough i uh, i was able to uh, i bought a spare one that i i used to redeem with you the using the original method of the, uh, sending it to you via um, counterparty to redeem for one of the uh, the miners which is super cool yeah yeah, so that, how many miners did you redeem back in the day with the token? Do you remember? I plan to relaunch a new uh, sh like shopping cart style website like that was Cebu.com before and have a lot of different types of physical objects uh, available to trade for Cebu token. So I want it to be a digital 
token that like how it was originally planned out but like with a slight change of the type of products available you know so like this art piece that i'm working on right now with electronic waste from mining operations is uh i wanted to sell the physical art crypto art in exchange for Cebu tokens i still want to do the original project's idea i don't want to change what the project is about i want it to stay true to what its roots are you know sure yeah you cut out there for a second um so i didn't i didn't hear you went uh with, like how many you like miners were actually redeemed back in the day for the the token oh back back in the day there was a pre-order by by one person uh named dan he's on twitter as dan beck he was a a friend of mine in the 2014 era and he supported me by purchasing two he was the first person to purchase them he purchased two sabu tokens but um there was some unfortunate events that happened in august of 2014 that made the project get put on hold um so in 2014 august like was scammed by a, a guy he did like a long con on me and it like ruined everything that i had built and uh i was very depressed about how bitcoin uh activity caused me to have such a great loss and that that was very harsh and it made me quit cryptocurrency for a couple of years until 2017 i got back into it um so that initial sale of two to dan he never actually claimed them he still has the sabu token he didn't claim them for miners and the first person to actually make the exchange for the claim was it would be crunchy cat who claimed there's a a couple of weeks ago and the second person would be you zero g would be the second person that claimed it and so you guys are part of a project that took eight years of time to really Jeez. complete a complete like one full cycle you know so mm -hmm. it took so long right but it, it's hard to explain why it took so long it, it just really hurts so i don't I don't want to want to talk about it too much, but now I'm in a much better place and I'm happy with life. So I'm able to work on the Cebu token, even though it's like kind of painful sometimes when I'm working on it, but the positive feelings that the historic NFT community gave me is making those bad feelings go away. So I, that's why I really appreciate it. Love you all. Man, that's really awesome. I, you know, I, I have to say too, I've, um, I've taken some really massive L's in the past too. I, um, you know, I, I got scammed once before that really hurt too. So I, I know, I know what you're talking about, but, um, you know, like, like what I had to do to, um, it's just, is just remember that in crypto, there's, um, like what's amazing about crypto is there's always another opportunity out there. Like, um, you know, there's, I mean, and you're lucky that you like now you have like this amazing asset that, you know, like you said, you don't have a you're not in a rush. You can kind of figure out what your game plan is going forward. But you have an amazing asset with the, your that big stack of the Cebu tokens that, you know, you have a, a ton of opportunities going forward. And, you know, there's other other opportunities, too. I mean, you know, like your the ticket thing sounds really um that VIP ticket system sounds really cool too. I mean, there's, you know, I'm sure you'll, uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll do something super cool, but uh, yeah. So, well, really, um, I really thought it was, uh, uh, amazing to be able to actually get one of those original, I think it was an R box miner, um, for, by redeeming the token. So I thought it was cool also that, you know, you end up back with your, uh, another one of your own tokens too, uh, out of the, the deal too. Yeah, I, I like to have it go back into circulation instead of having the token burned. Like, I know other people that may have, like, a similar concept of digital, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure majority of them are burning the token when the physical is claimed. 
Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't really like the idea of burning tokens too much. Um, but sometimes it has a purpose, you know, but the Cebu token in, in, in my uh, heart and in my eyes, like is too valuable to burn. Yeah. I, I you know, I, um, there's some projects that do the burning and, and, you know, some artists will burn their own tokens for different purposes. And, and I, um, and even there's, there, there's distribution methods for, for like some projects with like, um, you know, where they'll do sales where you can, um, you know, whatever doesn't sell will get burned. And it always kind of makes me cringe a bit just because, um, you know, while that, that may help the sales in the, like right now, it, it's limiting the, the possibility for, for more people to be able to buy it in the future, you know? Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Like it's, it's, it's like a double-edged sword, you know, like yeah. you at, at one time you're, doing this one thing that's going to be helpful to you. And then at the other time you're doing something that's going to be detrimental. Yeah, it is. It is really a, like a dual edged sword. You know, the other thing is that, um, you know, like right now, especially like we're in a bear market while we're recording this in um, 2022, you know, there's, there's, so there's less demand right now, but ultimately I see that, you know, even with just a thousand supply of the of your Cebu token, I mean, there's going to be more than a thousand people in the future that would want to own that, you know. So to to burn that down to you know, I don't know whatever it would end up being at through all the you know, like your through your your store or whatever. I mean, you know, to burn that down to a half that that's just less people that will be able to to own it in the future. Yeah, that's that's true. So the um... What kind of other questions? Maybe we could talk a little bit about um, what I've been yeah. doing on Tezos. Yeah, let's let's talk about your your Tezos work. You you mentioned that you've you've started doing some photography and whatnot. Um, yeah, go ahead and tell me um, what you've been doing there. Sure. So um, I went to a Tezos meetup in LA, and my friend encouraged me to go, and I I got introduced to Tezos then and. Uh, like at the a little bit before COVID started, like maybe a year before COVID started. And I had uh, thought it was an amazing piece of technology because it reduced the amount of waste caused by proof of work mining and consensus. So I had, I have grown unhappy with the way coins are mined, you know, like they, they build hardware and then they sell the hardware and then people mine, they waste a bunch of electricity and then they destroy all the hardware because it becomes obsolete. They buy new hardware. It's just a waste of resources all around everywhere at every point of its existence. So then my mind, and then I feel like the proof of work system is not good. So I saw Tezos was a proof of stake system. And I was like, this is great. It's ecologically friendly. It's not going to cause e-waste. It's not going to cause elect uh, electricity waste. And it is done in a good way. So I got a big bag of Tezos, and then I became a Tezos baker, which is like a validator yeah. or a master node. So I have a Tezos baker, and then I, then I created a token on Tezos, my own token, which was Seb, I call it, S the ticker is SCB, Seb token. But it's the Cebu.net XTZ Baker DAO token. That's like the full description. So basically what happened was people in the Tezos system, the validator or the baker is the one that gets to vote in the governance process of Tezos, the on-chain governance of Tezos, which deals with protocol amendment. And I wanted to give people a voice in the process of the amendment process to basically make it so whoever is part of my delegation underneath under the umbrella of my baker that they're delegated to the baker they give me their voting power in the, pro the in the protocols amendment process so i wanted to give the voting power back to them by giving them a dao token and allowing them to vote within a DAO to decide how I'm going to act and vote in the on-chain governance system for the protocol amendment. 
And I wanted to create a developer team that could take proposals from the DAO members and the developer team would accept the proposal and develop what the whatever they wanted. So like instead of having people like DM me and say, hey, can you build me a smart contract? I want them to come to the DAO and make a proposal to the DAO and say, hey, Cebu.net, DAO, I want you to build this contract, smart contract for me and a platform. And um, here we, uh, now all my DAO members can say, yeah, Cebu, you should take that job. So we vote yay on taking the job from this new client and uh, the DAO will get like a percentage of the money that is p- uh, paid by the client. And then the, the, the developer team gets paid by the DAO and the developer teams are DAO members. So everybody's kind of like winning here, you know? And it's like a process of eliminating a weak offer of work. So like if someone just messages me and says, hey man, can you make me this contract? And then they're just wasting my time because they're not serious. But if someone comes to the DAO and says, hey, can you make me this smart contract? I made a proposal. I have a thousand Cebu token to make the proposal. And I vote with 10,000 Cebu tokens. Uh, yay for the proposal. And they're they're basically very serious about getting their work done by Cebu.net. So that's kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to like filter out all the low intentions of getting work done and then uh, amplify the the high intentions you know and yeah, then interesting i got a dao token now okay and then i got to distribute the dao token so i did an airdrop to of the dao token to every single person that was delegating to my tezos baker so all the there's like 1600 wallets that were delegating to the baker and they all got a bunch of sub token and then I was like, hey, I got to distribute more SEP token. How am I going to do this? And then the farm, a staking farm came online on, on Tezos. And the code was open source. So within three days of the Tezos farm going online, it was with RAP protocol. RAP protocol was making Tezos farming possible with liquidity pool tokens would get staked. And then you would earn RAP tokens in a duration of time of while you're liquidity pool tokens were being staked so i forked the the liquidity pool staking farming website code and i launched my own sub farm so the cebu.net farms was the third staking farm that went live on tezos and that made the sub token pump really big because all these projects that were on tezos uh would have to buy sub token and then they would pay me the sub token that they wanted to get distributed in the staking farm. So all these pro, I went around and like talked to all the project managers and offered them to make a farm for them in an exchange of they would buy a sub token and pay like a little service fee to get the farm going. And then that went well, it went really good. And then I wanted to do the next thing. I was like, hmm, what else do I fork? So I forked uh, the dashboard for the decentralized exchange platform called KipuSwap on Tezos Mm -hmm. because KipuSwap kept crashing and it was very unreliable at the time and people were missing out on their trades and they were getting upset. So I made a dash, uh, I forked the front end of KipuSwap.com and I I Cebuified it. You know, I created like some changes to make it more like in my flavor. So then I launched dex.sabu.net, which was the dashboard that would let you interact with the smart contract for the decentralized exchange that was going on on Tezos. So it wasn't a full on decentralized exchange because I was using their contracts. So like, it was more like a mirror, you know, like our port mm-hmm. or like a backup portal is kind of like what I called it. And so I had my own DEX portal now and where I could whitelist, <laughs> I whitelisted all the tokens that were in the SEB farms. So all these like really poo-poo projects, there's like a bunch of poo-poo projects that now had the ability to get whitelisted on the exchange. Cause like the, the decentralized exchange wasn't like going around and whitelisting whoever, you know, but like all my clients, like I whitelisted them to give them like a little, a little extra 
boost for me, you know? And that was really cool. And that the decks was received received happily and everybody was happy with it. And that was a good project to get going. And then after that, um after that, what was I do? I I, I on Tezos I the that the dashboard for the DAO was finally released. So the dashboard for the DAO was built on Tezos dash home base IO. And I created the DAO contract on there and then started working on improving the code of the of the dashboard and DAO creation manager website. And I worked closely with the developers over the course of like a year and a half and revised a lot of things for them and found a lot of bugs for them. And I helped them with building up the dashboard for DAO management. And at that point, I, I got to be the biggest DAO on Tezos based on member count but then they you know we had to change the DAO contract because they made a new version of the website and we had to migrate all the assets from one DAO to another DAO and that process was really time consuming really really time consuming but it was it was very helpful to the ecosystem because during that process of like a year long process of transferring all the assets from one DAO to a new DAO contract I've in that process I found a lot more bugs and reported them, you know. So they we really worked a lot on the Tezos home base site. And then another crazy thing I did on Tezos that was like a stunt, like kind of like my Sybil attack on Seacoin, was um in the governance, I wanted to make a protocol amendment. So this whole governance system, the validator is the one or no, the baker, the baker slash validator is the one that proposes the code change to the network. And then all the other bakers get to vote yes or no on trying out that code change. So in the proposal phase of Tezos's on-chain governance process is when I went and attempted to make a protocol change. So I looked at the Tezos protocol code and the process of how to make protocol code proposals. And it was very, very complicated for me. And the, the documentation was spread around all over the place. And it was very difficult for me to understand the documentation because a lot of it was outdated and like a little bit not like not super descriptive in a way for me to easily understand. So I got frustrated and I wasn't doing things right. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm just going to go crazy right now. And I was going crazy because I was on a deadline and I had to submit my protocol amendment quickly. And this is, this is another reason why I like Tezos so much is because I have the ability to change the protocol code of Tezos. I don't have the ability to change the protocol code of Ethereum or Bitcoin. None of them. They're all like the core teams are like, all very very like strictly bought out or whatever they sold out but tezos is so decentralized I, I believe it's more decentralized than bitcoin and ethereum because i have the ability to change its protocol code i can't go around and change protocol code of anything else only bitcoin i mean only tezos because of the on-chain governance system is designed in the most decentralized way you could have it and so what i did was instead of proposing actual code and changes to the network, I discovered that I could just inject a proposal that's empty and there's no code in the proposal. But what I did was the proposal that I injected into the network was just a vanity. It's like, it was a hundred percent vanity. Like, you know how, when you could put vanity into a, a crypto address, like yeah. say for example you want your name to be uh the prefix you know yeah. like so i did that where the entire hash for the protocol hash was vanity and the things that i wrote i had 20 of them i had 20 vanity addresses and i developed a way to just inject vanity messaging system i called it like an emergency broadcast messaging system into the tezos code and mm -hmm. people were going crazy, crazy. Hold on. That's a decline this call.
Um, so people were very, very, some people were extremely upset what I did because it's kind of like cryptocurrency vandalism on the blockchain. You yeah, you're, you're repurposing that entire purpose of the, um, of that, you know, that process in order to just spam out, you know, vanity messages. Yeah. So the, every, every single person on the entire network had to look at my, uh, proposal injections. And then the next day after everyone was just going crazy. They're like, Oh my God, Sabu was the first person outside the core developer team to inject the proposal but he did it completely wrong and he just spammed us all. Oh my God, he's a spammer. Kick him out, kick him out, get rid of him, get rid of him. And then other people were like messaging me. They're like, oh my God, I'm so proud of you. You you like, you like, did a groundbreaking thing by being like breaking the ice. You know, like I broke the ice of developing Tezos protocol code. Because after I showed everybody that you don't have to be a core developer to change the code. Anybody could change the code. And then I got other people motivated to make their own developer teams outside of the core team to work on the code. So I inspired several other teams to start making code. And I feel like I inspired a bunch of people in a good way, but then people, some people looked at my injections as like self-serving advertisement spam, you know, like mm -hmm. in the last uh, proposal phase that was between October 8th, and October 22nd of this year, I injected a code that says, here, I'll paste it in here into the chat we have. It says, it says PT, PT is the prefix, and it says Cebu for sale at the OpenSea by Cebu best HNFT GGG. That's the, <laughs> and then it says BLA7S because the last four is like a checksum. So you mm -hmm. can't use the last four in the hash. So I developed, um, I developed a tool it makes it so easy to make these. I have a, like a little tool now where I can just pump these out. So every like three months, I'm going to be injecting protocol hashes into the network to basically advertise for free because when I inject the <laughs> protocol hash into the network, there's no, there's no charge. They don't even charge you. There's like, there's no fee. There's no well, money you got to put down. Like yeah, it's the, probably... it's a free transaction onto the network. Everyone has to see it. It's crazy. Yeah, there's probably no way or no system in place to prevent people from from um, submitting these proposals because, of course, it's supposed to be decentralized and allow participation from anyone. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> that's very clever. Yeah, the, it was very fun. So that they they there's a couple users that were um you know high up there like that were upset and they were like, you know, we gotta make a, a protocol amendment change where if you inject a proposal, you have to pay a hundred Tezos, and if your proposal gets rejected, your hundred Tezos is burned. So basically, they're trying to develop code to get me to stop exploiting the system, <laughs> <laughs> but nobody no serious developers are really looking into it because if they do that, they're going to hurt the decentralization. Now, Sabu is shooting himself in the foot when he does this. So let him just shoot himself in the foot, whatever, you know, like they, it's not bothering anybody too much. It's just making Sabu look like a kook or whatever. But, <laughs> and then it gets people like, um, thinking you know like i really got i even got hired to be on a protocol code amendment team so like a month after the first time i did it which was like a while ago the uh, team hired me to be actually working legitimately on testing their protocol amendment and they paid me to be on a real team so like this little stunt got the attention of like a real job you know so that's yeah. kind of like how my life in crypto has been. I will go and I'll be poor and broke and desperate and I'll go do some crazy stunt. And then someone will be like fascinated by the stunt and they'll be like, Sabu, here's a real job for you to do. We see you're talented. Now just put it to good use, you know? That's, really that's kind of like my life. Yeah, you know... Um... I guess the other benefit, I, I guess I could say too, is you're you're bringing more attention to to basically the 
you know, the protocol development of the network too, you know? Yeah, that was the main intention of the logic behind doing it was to, the best part about Tezos is the on-chain governance. People don't understand like how it really actually works because it's, it's just like not really celebrated that much. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to get people more excited about the on-chain governance because it is literally, in my opinion, the best part of Tezos. And if people could see like the protocol amendment system being more competitive instead of always just vote yes for the core dev team, vote yes for the core dev team, everybody vote yes for the core dev team. It's boring. Now, if you have multiple teams working different angles on approving the core protocols code, the competition will inspire the developers to make even better proposals. So yeah. in the long run, it's going to be very beneficial to inspire more teams. Like if there's multiple teams siloed all around the world, not just like in France or whatever, because the main core dev team is in France. Mm -hmm. But if we had like a core dev, like if we had a protocol development team now is in LA too. So we got a good team in LA now and we got a good team in France. You know, who's next? Like we're trying to get Africa rolling too. There's a lot of... Tezos Africa projects that I help um, help with. Like uh, in Africa, there's this project called Kuaka. And what it is, is basically they're helping African crypto users launch Tezos Bakers. And I personally have helped uh, like four or five bakers get online in Africa. Um, one of them is in Ivory Coast. One is in Ghana. One is in Cameroon, and one of them was, I believe, in Nigeria. Like, whenever their baker, like, crashes or goes offline, they message me, and I help them get back online. I teach them how to vote in the governance process. I teach them how to gather new delegations. I help them, like, optimize their scripts and codes to get their baker running efficiently. So I'm doing, like... Uh, I'm not getting paid to do those things, but you know, the notoriety and appreciation I get from the community is enough for me. So I've done a lot of stuff like that voluntarily, still voluntarily helping people mine, you know? But I mean that you're, you're right though, about the, the on-chain governance that it is huge. I mean, that's one of the, one of the things that's a little bit worrying for me about Bitcoin is that essentially, you know, we have the, the, they have that BIP process, but essentially the the core dev team has unilateral decision to basically yay or nay that, you know, there's no, there's no way to circumvent them. You know what I mean? Regardless of, of what the community wants. That is, that is precisely what I've been trying to make a point out of in, in this, uh, what we've been conversating about just now <laughs> that, that concept like remember in 2017 i think it was yeah. where like there was that whole new york agreement thing and mm -hmm. bitcoin cash fork and bitcoin sv fork and all these other bitcoin forks and there was this huge debates and you know like it was it was not pretty it was not a pretty thing it felt no. like the whole network was now being held hostage and it's it's bought and sold and paid for and it's been co-opted you know that's kind of what i thought that's yeah, I mean, why I got led to Tezos. I mean, I I, I see both sides of, of the the arguments on the um um on what happened with 2017. I, I ultimately what's ironic though is that you know they turned it into such a the way that it was handled was so scorched earth and polarized that I think it really did hurt hurt the network in the sense that you know, like people are pushing for, for lightning as a scaling solution, which, you know, which is cool and all, but, you know, one is it's extremely late. Um, but two is that in order for, for lightning to work, it needs larger blocks too. I, I read the first like page or two of like the lightning white paper. And now um, I think in order for it to scale globally, you know, as, as Bitcoin's original vision, it would, it was either like eight or 16 meg blocks. But my like my worry is that 
you know, that, that process was so contentious and so, um, so crazy that, um, that people have been become so like polarized against even considering increasing the block size, even to, to incorporate that because that's tantamount to, to admitting that, you know, that they like, maybe, maybe not even wrong, but that they needed to be more flexible where they took a, you know, a extremely hardline position back then. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very, I, I agree with that. They, it, it was very, uh, they called it contentious fork, you know, mm -hmm. and they tried to spin it as like, kind of like it was a good thing, but, and, and as you said, like it, it, it impacted, um, the entire ecosystem negatively and in in my eyes like and if it happens again and again and again they're like setting a precedent you know like if you don't like something fork it and go build it over there you know like the the big one that just had its own terrible fork was the luna classic versus luna you know mm -hmm. like they're just trying to try and or ethereum and ethereum classic and then you know what is going to happen if like ethereum 2.0 with the staking feature like what if people's coins never get unlocked for example what yeah. they, is there's going to be another group of people that come and force their own fork into ethereum where it somehow unlocks everybody's coins because you know the core dev team is incapable of finishing the project in a reasonable amount of time you know like that can happen and that will devalue ethereum immensely if that happens and yeah i mean they, they, like yeah, I just heard too what you're talking about recently, where now the the Ethereum devs don't have a hard deadline for uh, allowing withdrawals from staking. That is um, that is very frightening. You know, um, I don't. I mean, the other the other big my other big worry, like Ethereum has, like they're at least have on their new roadmap. Um, you know, they're they're going to be working on implementing post quantum secure cryptography. And one of my worries is that Bitcoin has become so ossified that they're not. There's no BIPs in the pipeline right now to implement um, post quantum cryptography for the signature scheme. You know, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of advancement in that space, both from the physical quantum computers, but also with with virtual qubits and whatnot. I I'm really worried that that um, because the the development is so centralized that even if we see this coming even imminently like with a few years heads heads up that you know ultimately we can't force the core devs to do anything which is you know they could literally let the network blow up essentially and lose absolutely everything because we can't force them to to do anything yeah it's 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 very sad to think about the negative parts about it and then, you know, that's why I kind of, I don't know who exactly, I think it was consensus or coin census, right? Mm -hmm. That pays the core dev team. Is that correct or no? Yeah. So, so it's like the funding comes from a few different sources. Um, I'd have to, like, there's a chart that, that shows where, where all the parties involved. I mean, you've got uh, like, di like think digital currency group owns, owns a stake, um, I don't know. It's it's complicated. Yeah, there's like uh, Blockstream, uh, Consensus, um, DCG, and I think like AXA has a stake in there somehow. Um, but anyway, yeah. But, but the, the problem being is that there's, you know, a centralized team managing that. You know, there's yeah. So what happens in in my in my eyes, what's happened is basically that. Oh, that's my mom. We'll have to edit that out. <laughs> Give me one second. Okay, so let me go back in my room here. I guess I'm having a glass of water. Okay, so okay, starting back up here. Um, so so in my eyes and in my mind, like the Bitcoin core team is beholden to the needs and demands of those stakeholders. So the core development of Bitcoin is going to go forward in a way that benefits those those stakeholders the most because they're the ones that say what Bitcoin core development team has to develop. 
So that's why I was saying earlier that it's been co-opted, you know? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I totally hear you. And that's one of my, um, that's, you know, that's, they have a conflict of interest with the scaling tech, you know, they had, um, you know, that's like, you know, that like them support, not supporting increasing the block size back then was a, is a conflict of interest because they were creating their own like liquid, you know, scaling, you know, as a scaling solution for a problem. You know what I mean? It, it's like, it's very, it gets very messy and murky, you know, because the, it's not, you know, the incentives are not aligned, you know, for the entire community, essentially. Yeah. So that, that, that logic is, um, and that, that uh, understanding is what pushed me towards uh, Tezos. And yeah. I have to go and research what other chain is going to be doing a similar practice of on-chain governance where an average user like like our high our power user like myself i'm not like a full-on developer my friends call me a power user so hardware and networking development i could do really well but uh code like straight code development i'm still working on my skills for that but when i see how those chain like how the money all went into Bitcoin, but then we have Tezos here that is very undervalued in my opinion. And I actively work on Tezos because I believe the on-chain governance, that process that they have is going to be the winner in the long run. Mm -hmm. As as we were as you we were talking about the quantum computing being a prob they're gonna be a problem for uh cryptocurrencies yeah. encryption being cracked. What is what is uh, going to be the roadblock for Bitcoin to be able to defend against that? What if it is, is not soon enough? And what if it is there's a contention between the improvement, like, and and the in Tezos, I'll be able to bring it up. You know, I will be yeah. able to just make a proposal that says, "Hey guys, we should uh, start working on this now." You know, like, and then people that understand the proposal is about starting to work on it instead of just being the actual work itself they might get in, encouraged and excited to start working on defending against quantum encryption cracking as you mentioned so yeah. that um it makes me kind of sad that tezos didn't really do well this bull run compared to other coins like solana or AI Tom or near or whatever, like you want to name off like the top 50 and Tezos is number 51, you know, but I don't know why I keep kind of like picking the crypto to work on. Cause I put like all my attention into one crypto coin, like in 2017, when I was all in on Sia coin and that didn't pan out the greatest. And then this bull run, I was hundred percent focused on Tezos and, yeah, I did make some money and, and I took profit when I could, but compared to like if I had been working on Solana instead, man, I could have made way more money probably, but, or even well, if I just worked on Ethereum, you know, but I, well, we, we I know really one like of the, the reasons government. why, why uh, Solana pumped so much is the, oh yeah. The... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Now it makes sense. Yeah. All that yeah. fake, all that fake uh, pumping probably by SPF and oh. stuff. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, it's it's amazing to uh, a lot of stuff made made a lot more sense in retrospect. You know, one of the things I I, um, I was a lot I was actually kind of excited about Solana um, last year until uh, it came out like after the fact. I I read maybe it was six months ago, nine months ago, um, maybe a year ago. I, I read that you know they even they even played uh, played these games with the ish token issuance for. Solana too, where they claimed that was one amount of, of tokens in, in issuance or circulation, but secretly they had, um, uh, this has come out, that they had like another 10 million or something that they had, uh, they had minted and had pledged as collateral or something like that. I mean, so just scams abound, right? You know, and that, to your point too, it also lacks um, a clear decentralized governance structure, 
So it's, I mean, it's super centralized. So. Yeah, that's very unfortunate what happened to the Solana. They had very, you know, the marketing and everything was good, but then they ended up being like trapped. Like, did you hear about the Solana wrapped Bitcoins and Solana wrapped Ethereum are yeah. not even backed anymore? Yeah, that's horrible. So horrible. Yeah. That's so, so scary. Like, all these wrapped coins have the potential to be like that. And it's, it's very frightening, you know? Yeah. I guess the, I mean, since we're kind of on the topic, the, the, to me, the elephant in the room is tether, you know, I mean, I think most people have known that it's a scam for years. Um, I just don't know. Like I'm really surprised that after Luna was taken down that uh, either a bank or a hedge fund or a consortium of hedge funds, didn't decide to just uh, go after Tether and take it down too, you know. I have a connection to Craig Sellers, and I've I've talked to him a, a couple of times. He's seems super legit, man. I I, I think Tether's the only really legit uh, rap dollar coin out there. Well, the you know the the problem is they've never had a an audit. the The only thing they've done are these attestations, which um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Wirecard thing. Um, like, uh, so with Wirecard, that was like one of the largest frauds in um, in German history. What what they did in order to get around the um, basically proving that they had funds, they would um, they would take a super short term loan of, you know. I don't know, 50 million or 100 million or whatever it was that they needed to prove they had. They took these ultra short term loans. They parked it into a um, into a bank account. They had a um, they had someone attest that the funds were there. And then the next day they send that money back and, you know, bam. So you can't the 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 secrecy with Tether and the fact I think they they admitted that they invested in some. I don't know some risky assets and have even loaned um even loaned assets too. I don't know. I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole, you know, no matter how how nice the guy is. Yeah, if if if, if you had if you had to ask Craig a question, what would you ask him? Maybe I could relay it for you. Uh why no uh why no like credible third party uh audit? Okay, you got it. You got it. I'll I'll see if he responds to that. <laughs> I mean, really, that's that's the uh, you know, you know, if you're you're playing around with big money, you know, there's why why would you not have transparency on these matters? I mean, I, yeah, I don't see a good that's, reason. That's very under. Un, that's a very good question to ask. I'm gonna just take a second here to write that down. So you said, why is there no uh, fully accredited uh, third, party um, third party audit, right? Yeah. yeah is that exactly. how it? Mm -hmm. Okay, for sure. I got that. <laughs> got that yeah, down. That would, Maybe I'll fill like, it to... like, that would have to, of course, include any uh, any pledges or liabilities against the the collateral too. So, yeah. anyway, you know, whatever. Um, it is important thing to ask. Yeah. So, on Tezos, there's a lot of uh, wrapped tokens also. Um, okay. And I have d played around with them a little bit, but in in general, in my history of using crypto, I've usually stayed away from using uh tether i've actually probably like never really had more than a hundred dollars worth of tether or or these other ones usdc or uh what else is the other one um busd or mm -hmm. there's some on tezos called usdtz and then there's a uh, kusd which is colibri finances usd mm -hmm. version which is an algorithmically stabilized, collateralized 
on chain collateralized dollars. So I think the way Calibria is doing it is the best form of doing it because you have to put your collateral up on chain into a, what they call an oven. And it sits there and you in in return you could take out KUSD as a as a loan on your own collateral. Mm-hmm. And it's algorithmically stabilized based on people getting liquidated when their collateral is worth less than what they have loaned out by more than 10%. So you could, let's say, for example, you put in 100 Tezos and Tezos is at a dollar. You could take out like, uh, I believe like $40 worth of KUSD. So it's 180% backed. And there's a DAO, an on-chain DAO, that governs the protocol too. Calibri DAO is K DAO is the token for that. But Tether doesn't have a DAO. It's all like behind secret shadowy curtains and stuff, you know? Exactly. Yeah. That that's that's the the whole point versus, you know, um these open protocols. So again, I I, I have strong, strong suspicions that there um there's it's not well i think they even admitted a while ago that they're not fully backed but they used to um they used to claim that they were so again there's these again it's it's not clear it's not transparent and uh you know i've only used tether within an exchange in order to you know you had some of those exchanges where they only have a pair that that um that trades with tether so yeah i wouldn't hold any for long term yeah there, there's a lot of traders that i know that they're like at the end of day they just tether out everything you know they only day trade so when they're done trading for the day they'll tether everything and then take it out of the exchange mm-hmm. so that's like what the majority usage of tether most likely is you know yeah or not that makes sense but, so those those day traders are the ones that you know what else is crazy is like when they issue tether and big, like they issue, like say for example, they issue like a hundred million tether. Like, who knows where that tether is being backed? And then what they do is they go pump Bitcoin with it, you know, for example. And then the tether gets a bigger bag of Bitcoin in exchange for their tether, and now the Bitcoin price is pumped. So like, whenever they issue tether, Bitcoin pumps, right? Yeah. Yeah, because it's they pretty can easy buy- to monitor that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that was that's one of the things that people suspected in the 2017 bull run is that they would they basically had this circle going where they would keep um the the price of bitcoin went up so they had more collateral backing that so they could buy more they'd issue more tether and buy more bitcoin and you know it just kept kept going up. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, is that what that is pretty dangerous if that's actually what's going on. That's, a, that's a you know, suspicion. It's, it's it's not been yeah. confirmed but um, Yes, of course. But it it looks, you know, I've seen some people do some analysis and it 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 certainly looks like a, a pretty um a pretty decent uh likelihood of what was going on. So, you know, again, we, we don't know what, what's going on because there's zero transparency. It's again like these other open protocols, they they don't really like the way they make money and the like the ma- management of assets is all on protocol, you know. <clears throat> so Anyway, <clears throat> yeah, yeah let's go it. on to some of this. Yeah, what else did you yeah. want to talk about? Well, so we've talked about your DAO and your work with Tezos, um, you know, and and we've touched on your background in crypto and in art and um, and the um, and your token. So, is there any? Um, and we've also talked about kind of like your thoughts in 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 the current crypto space with, you know, on chain governance and um, and whatnot. Is there like is there anything you want to talk about going forward in the in the space, or is there anything else that you're excited about? Hmm. Let's see. Um, the thing that I'm ex- that that makes me happy. <laughs> this is kind of odd, I'd maybe say, but when I was initially getting into crypto, it was very heavily dominated by males. And they're just like me, like white male, mid-20s or 
30s young guys. It was the majority of the demographic. Now that NFTs and crypto art has become very easily accessible, there's a lot more female artists that are getting into the crypto space and the demographic of male and female is getting uh, more m- m- more stabilized or like more symmetrical, you know, like it, I would love to see it just be 50-50, you know, like 50% males, 50% females and all age demographics and all races and all countries and and then, you know, the L- and the LGBTQ people are 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 being re- received in a respectful manner, you know, and everybody's everybody's welcome now, and it's easier to welcome people because of NFTs. Like the ability for an average regular person that knows nothing about crypto, the their ability to get onboarded into crypto through NFTs. And increasing the adoption rate of crypto through NFTs is the most amazing thing that is going on also. Like, I'm very happy to see, like, wow, I might be able to find a girlfriend that's actually into crypto, (laughs) you know? That would be like a dream come true. Uh, Instead of having, like, a girlfriend that, like, hates it and hates me talking about it. And, like, that would be be really a poor relationship for me like now that there's more fish in the sea and you know everybody is being nice and friendly with each other and sharing their art with each other i feel it's more uh pleasant to be able to see communities being not just dominated by males but with women being supported and promoted so i when i see like sometimes i've been lately i've been contacting uh, female uh, crypto artists in the Tezo space and offering to help them gain more visibility, you know, like to give them my opinion on how they could improve their their crypto art sales and, uh, you know, explaining to them why they need a ledger wallet and things like that, like how to delegate to a baker and how to set up their profile so they gain more visibility. And there a lot of them are very thankful and receptive to the recommendations. But then, you know, like one out of 10 will be like scared and thinking I'm trying to scam them by telling them to connect to the, to delegate to the baker. You know, they think like the transaction of connecting to the baker that like I'll take their money, but it's, it's nothing like that. I'm the one that gives them money and, they stay fully liquid. So that has been fun for me lately. Like there's a lot of female photographers that I've been kind of crushing on, you know, <laughs> and because they're doing what I do. And I'm like, I'm seeing a um, the balance, like the balance is kind of getting more balanced now. And I think if the balancing of the community will help, bring new types of ideas and because a woman's intuition is different than a man's intuition so if we have more female intuition coming into the crypto space with like nurturing in the mind state instead of uh, a male's mind state which is more like hunting then it will become it will become like a better ecosystem and overall you know so that's the thing that's really exciting me about the crypto space and what um brings me happiness is that uh the demographic is getting normalized yeah that's that's the thing that excites me too about nfts is that um you know i'm sure you're you're more than familiar with it like over the years you tell so many people like to look at crypto and like so few people do but nfts have really been the like it makes it so much easier to to get people to on board because they can totally relate with art or pictures or you know collecting and um you know like onboarding people like all people like crypto is for everyone it's not for for any one group it's you know it's super important right now and it's um ensuring we have these open systems is is fundamental in order to safeguard you know human freedom you know 
Yeah, that and that's that's um that's like the the thing that really makes me happy like that um you know i i could i could be at a party you know like at a dance party like and i could just walk up to a girl and she'll be like hey what do you do i'm like oh i'm into crypto and nfts and so her eyes will just light up and she'll be like oh my god you got to tell me how to get into that i want to make nfts too because there's so many people that are artists out there and they find it hard maybe to be able to monetize their work because of all the roadblocks and gatekeepers and so on but you know it's like you could spur you could spawn a revolution in in art because of nfts and crypto art that is the main use case of crypto right now is the ability to create an nft and sell it and be able to you know make commerce with people online and when i was in 2014 and when i made sabu token and i realized how easy it was to make a token on counterparty i said in my mind i was like you know what in a few years every single person on this planet is going to have their own token they created and look at what's happening everybody is getting into creating their own tokens with nfts i was like saying to myself you know when I am retiring at 65 years old, there's going to be no social security. Social security is going to be gone. Like I'm not going to have social security from the government, but what I'm going to have is these tokens and my retirement is going to be, be going to be done and paid for by these tokens I created. And everybody is going to do the same thing. Everybody is going to, not be able to be supported by social security and they're going to be supported by their tokens that they created when they were younger and it's going to happen that's my vision for the future that i had in 2014 when i made Spoo token i told myself this and it's happening you know well, that's an incredible vision man um and so early on I... yeah it, it was it, it, it it's because like it's just so simply, easily, easily understood like that you could click a couple buttons, type in a name, a description, add an image to it, and boom, you have your own created token. And, it's, and it could be done with less than a dollar worth of Tezos spent to make your token. And you could have as many of them as you want, divisible by whatever number you want. And you can, you can um, sell them right away or give them away right away transacting them is super cheap that's what draw people into using tezos is all nft users right now like the DeFi on tezos is dead there's like hardly any DeFi really so the i can go out and onboard people all day every day and i would have a great time doing it and there'd be plenty of people lining up to get onboarded into the nft space and the, the reason I selected Tezos to do it on Tezos and onboard them to Tezos first was, you know, the Ethereum gas fees at the all-time high was like, you're spending $500 to mint and list the t uh, NFT, but to mint and list an NFT on Tezos, it's like, like a quarter or less than a quarter, 25 cents or something. So I could go give someone like five Tezos and it cost me like five bucks or 25 bucks and they could go and mint like like 50 nfts with that five tezos you know so i'm giving them really powerful tool to get them into adoption and then i help promote them with my dao by purchasing their nft and sending it to the dao and then they're like look a dao collected my nft and then when i go to events music events in la like i'll display their nft with a projector or tablets and screens and give them some uh, visibility at like a really uh, cool and fun atmosphere where people are receptive to art and excited to see art while they're like having fun dancing and drinking and socializing. That's what I want to do with the DAO. Like I want to take contributions of people's NFTs in exchange for a small amount of sub token where they can become a member 
and I use this stage that I'm building. The, the DAO to, in my eyes is like a stage that I'm building and there's lights and cameras and action. And I have this big stage and I want to bring like these unknown artists that are up and coming onto the stage and display them and share my stage that I have with other, with these newer users, you know? Because of my seniority, the stage being built is going to be really cool, you know, and it'll be respected because of the OG status. And I could just use the OG status to promote this stage that I've been working on. That's what the DAO in my eyes is. And if I could get all these artists and collectors to join the DAO, then when someone makes a proposal, to the DAO and says, hey, I want the DAO to make a music video, produce a music video for my song that is an NFT that is in the DAO. And then the DAO would take money out of the treasury and say, okay, we're going to spend this much money to produce a music video for this song. And we're going to have these DAO members work on the crew of building, build, uh, producing this music video nft and then when the music video nft comes out the dao will list the music nft music video nft on the marketplace and the treasury will be able to get income out of what it produced itself so that's kind of like the organizational mindset i have with that i'm really excited about like the, the dao is going to be able to make contract calls soon basically yeah, I mean, I I think the future is with with DAOs in general. Um, I mean, you know, it like we can you can create a DAO that that um, you know instead of the in the normal legal world in the U.S. or it or internationally, we can you know and with DAOs the the main purpose doesn't have to be about making money or or bound in these you know I don't know those those old old paradigms you know so yeah it's it's super cool what know what you guys will be able to do for sure so we have been there for a little yeah. bit what is there anything else we wanted to cover you think or we're... well i mean i i think we're we're pretty good how about uh how about you is there anything else you wanted to touch on um i can't think i can't think of anything right now i'm like okay. i'm very happy with the interview so far it's been amazing man yeah, it's been really fun talking to you. I mean, we we kind of uh, kind of went in a couple a uh, couple little um, uh, segues, but that's okay. It was, uh, it was certainly a really fun conversation, you know, um, talking to you. So I certainly appreciate you uh, appreciate you on the podcast. Yeah, thank thank you so much for letting me be on your podcast, uh, Zero G. When 